gray, cloudy day many years ago when I stood in the office of the department chairman, the biochemistry department chairman at Princeton University as he discussed his plans for future hiring in the department. I was then a PhD student in biochemistry, and I was very excited about my recent research findings. I had discovered a protein called the RecA protein, and this protein was produced in large amounts when the DNA in cells, the genetic material in cells, was damaged. The RecA protein could help repair that damage. I loved being a graduate student. I rode my bike to the laboratory every day, and I waited with anticipation for gels that separated the proteins in cells to finish running so that I could see if the RecA protein was produced or not. I didn't have much money, but I really very much appreciated the opportunity to be studying questions related to life itself. How do cells grow? How do cells become cancerous? How do cells die? The chairman of the biochemistry department then uh, explained to me that while women in science could be good PhD students when supervised by their advi advisors or professors, that they, uh, as long as he was chairman, he would not hire a woman as a faculty member because women just couldn't cut it in science. I stood there in front of him, stunned and silent. I still didn't have my PhD. I couldn't argue with him. At that time, Princeton had very few women students, and in a way, I felt I should be grateful to be there studying among the many men at this famous Ivy League school. Well, I did get my PhD, and I continued my research at the University of California in San Francisco, where I discovered a cause of one of the boy-in-the-bubble type of immunodeficiency diseases. This discovery made me want to continue my career in research and start my own lab as a, a professor in a university. But before, before I could do that, I had to identify a research area that would really interest me for many years. I had to distinguish myself from the, uh, the professors who had been my, my teachers and my mentors. What research area would I pick? What was I going to be interested in for many years? Well, I found the answer in a, a compound called vitamin A. It's a vitamin that uh, many of you may have taken in a vitamin pill this morning. Why was I interested in vitamin A? Well, the next slide will show you a discovery that made me fascinated and excited about vitamin A. So we know that uh, we know that, uh, that many animals, including some types of amphibians, can regrow their limbs if their limbs are accidentally cut. The, um, this term is called regrowth or regeneration. We uh, know that amphibians can do this, but why not humans? Why can't we do this? Well, intriguingly, retinoic acid a compound similar to vitamin A, can supersize this regeneration process in amphibians. So if an amphibian limb is cut, for example, at the wrist, then normally just the hand would regrow from the wrist. But if the amphibian limb is cut at the wrist and then soaked briefly in retinoic acid, an entire limb will regrow from the wrist. It's fascinating. So what this says is that retinoic acid can control the barcodes or the zip codes of the many different types of cells that are regrowing in the limb 
so that they know their position and where to go. Well, I had found a, a research question, how is this done? I had found a research question that would fascinate me for many years. I then interviewed for a faculty position at Harvard Medical School. One of the first faculty members who interviewed me was an older, very famous professor. As I walked into his office, the first thing he said to me was, are you any good? Why should we hire you? <laughs> Not all the faculty who interviewed me were so negative in their, their feelings, so I was able to, I was offered a position in the pharmacology department, offered a position as an assistant professor at uh, Harvard Medical School. The challenge then is to attract graduate students, PhD students to my lab, to obtain funding for research from the National Institutes of Health, and to make important discoveries, exciting discoveries. That's what professors at universities do. Um, I stayed at Harvard for about 10 years, and during the course of that time, the pharmacology department grew to be a department in size of over 30 faculty members. However, in the 10 years I was at Harvard Medical School, uh, I was, for the most, most of that time, the only woman faculty member in that department. So we know that, um, we know that vitamin A is required in our bodies. We take it in our food. We can't make this. We take it in our food, we eat it, or you could have, take it in a vitamin pill. And then it is, uh, much of it is stored in our livers. But what does it do? Well, we know that when we're missing vitamin A, some terrible things happen. When humans or animals are missing vitamin A, they're deprived of vitamin A in their diets. Uh, terrible things happen, such as loss of vision, uh, scaly skin, impaired immune system, increased respiratory infections, uh, loss of testicular function and, and sperm production, and ultimately death. But why is this? What does, what does vitamin A do? Well, now we know that uh, Retinoic acid, which is a more potent form of vitamin A, can cause immature stem cells in our bodies to grow up and specialize or become differentiated. That's the term we use. So an immature stem cell will grow up to be a muscle cell or a skin cell and take on the functions of a muscle or, or skin cell. Now, this uh, process goes on throughout our lives and this is one of the ways that retinoic acid can work. One of the discoveries that my laboratory made at Harvard Medical School is to show, the, to identify the new types of proteins that are made when these immature cells are growing up or are becoming differentiated in response to retinoic acid. Another, uh, another uh, thing that uh, vitamin A can do is to reduce wrinkles associated in the skin associated with aging. And this has been discussed widely in the uh, popular press, as you can see from this article that I found in Vogue magazine a few years ago when I was looking at the latest fashions. Uh, in vitamin A, another form of vitamin A is also used in the treatment of acne, and some of you may have used it, this drug uh, to treat your acne. Retinoic acid can also cause certain types of leukemias, not all types, but certain types of leukemia cells to become normal cells. 
normal white blood cells. Well, how does this happen? How does a cancer cell become a normal cell? We know that uh, when this maturation process that I was just describing that normally occurs throughout life breaks down or isn't functioning pro properly, if it's broken, then the, um, the cells, these immature cells just keep growing and growing and that's basically what cancer is. In this context, I don't have time to go through the details, but retinoic acid at high concentrations used as a drug can force, as you can see in this slide, can force these immature cells to become more specialized white blood cells in, in the body and they are no longer, uh, the, the cancer disappears and this, is one, this drug is used to treat this type of leukemia. Can we use retinoic acid in other types of cancers? That's one of the questions we're investigating now. So after um, about 10 years at uh, Harvard Medical School, I became a full professor with tenure. I then, I then left Harvard to be the chairman of the pharmacology department at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City, which is part of Cornell University. Uh, I enjoy being a chairman. I became the first woman to chair a basic science department at Weill Cornell Medical College, even though the medical college was founded over a hundred years ago. Now, I enjoy being a chairman very much. I, um, I love mentoring students. I uh, teach students, I teach medical students and I teach graduate students, uh, PhD students about drugs that are used in treating cancer and other diseases. I also run the pharmacology department and I run uh, the P PhD program in pharmacology, which is one of the biggest pharmacology PhD programs in the country with over 75 students. One of the first uh, items I put up on my wall when I became a chairman was a picture of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton because I knew that without them I wouldn't be able to be in the position of chairman of a department. In my uh, position as chairman of the department, I really enjoy mentoring both men and women as I think that this is critical for the future of biomedical research. I still ride my bike to the lab every day and I look forward in anticipation to the results of the, uh, of the members of my laboratory, the experimental results as we continue our quest to find answers to the questions of why people develop cancer, why do people grow old. Now this conference is called metamorphic, and I think it's very appropriate that I show an amphibian here, an axolotl, because amphibians start their lives in water and then they metamorphose and move onto the land where they continue their, their lives. Uh, the field of vitamin A research has grown, grown tremendously, and because of the the studies of many laboratories, including my own, we understand today much more about how this fascinating vitamin works in cells, but we don't know everything. However, we can dream. So, thinking back to the amphibians, could we harness the regeneration, this repair and regeneration process to help soldiers who lose limbs in combat, or to help uh, people who by, d during an accident or after an accident have lost fingers or arms or, or legs. But we don't have to stop there. We can dream even further. Uh, what about 
regenerating hearts. Some amphibians can regenerate their hearts and other organs, but humans cannot do this. Why is that? We don't know the answer right now as to why humans can't regenerate so many body parts, but maybe one of you in the audience will answer this question in the future. Now, what about that chairman of the biochemistry department who so many years ago said such disparaging things about women in science? Well, many artists have a muse, uh, an individual who gives them positive uh, motivation and inspiration. Well, I was angered by that chairman's uh, uh, comments about women in science many years ago. In a way, I used him as my muse. Every time I had a career achievement, I would think about those negative comments he made to me as a graduate student, and I would smile. Or if I uh, 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 came up to an obstacle, I had an obstacle to overcome, I would use the memory of that conversation as a motivation to overcome the obstacle. So I urge you to use your critics to become stronger, not weaker. Use your critics to motivate you and inspire you. Don't be defeated or lose self-confidence, especially you women in the audience. About, about um, a few years ago, I uh, was invited to a dinner with the former chairman of the biochemistry department. We were both invited to the same dinner, and we hadn't seen each other for 30 years. At that dinner, I sat next to him, and I said to him, I reminded him of the conversation many years before, of what he had said back when I was a graduate student about how women couldn't cut it in science. I expected him to have changed his views of women or to apologize, but what he said was, I don't remember ever saying anything like that. <laughs> well, it was at that point that I realized that I didn't need to use him as a muse anymore. <laughs> but I urge you to find your muse to help you to achieve success in life. Thank you very much. <laughs>